Um, so the next step, uh, and thanks to everyone who asked questions there and, and voted, that was great. It made it a lot easier. And I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone, but um, time is pushing on. So I'm going to ask all the panelists to turn their cameras on. Um, and what we're going to do is just go through each one. And Eileen is first, Eileen O'Sullivan. She is going to introduce herself and we're going to give the panelists five minutes each um, just to set their stall, to talk about the topic, to talk about where they're coming from. And then at the very end, after each of the five minutes, we're going to have a discussion. Um, and again, I, my preference is to use the Q&A um, panel for questions rather than what Evelyn wants to ask. Um, so thank you. And Eileen, the floor is yours. You're very welcome. Hi, hi. thank you for, for asking me here today. Um, my name is Adeline O'Sullivan. I'm a cancer patient and a cancer patient advocate. Uh, I sit on the research advisory board for the Irish Cancer Society and various other public health um, uh, uh, committees. Um, so I got a little bit lost there in John's conversation because it was so fascinating and so interesting. So I have to put my head on now to talk here about what I was going to talk about today. So thank you, John. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is, is the patient or the public, and more aptly, the citizen as a stakeholder in genomic research. No doubt most would agree it would be very difficult to conduct genomic research without the patient's genomic and clinical data. For any stakeholder collaboration, it needs to be based on trust. All the more relevant when there is an imbalance between the various stakeholders in respect of expertise and the power. Trust doesn't just happen, it evolves, and it evolves from communications and a set of behaviors, including, but not exclusively, from informing, transparency, honesty, fairness, ethics, and the relevant rule of law. As the world's most famous investment guru, my hero, Warren Buffett says, it can take 20 years to build a reputation and trust, but five minutes to ruin it. And if you think about that, you will do things differently. As a patient advocate with a strong interest in this subject of genomics research, my perspective on the current lie of the land will be similar to the following analogy of when an American tourist asked a Kerryman the specific route to a destination. The Kerryman replied, but I wouldn't start from here. I consider that all stakeholders in any genomic strategy are embarking on a journey together. Using the metaphor of a bus for this journey, some stakeholders are already on the bus, but the stakeholders haven't agreed a destination or a route to that destination. There doesn't appear to be an owner of the bus or an insurer of the bus. There is no designated driver to bring the stakeholders on any agreed route. Some of the stakeholders are grabbing the steering wheel and bringing the bus along their chosen route and destination. But the patient and the public as a stakeholder isn't on the bus for this journey at all. However, the patient and the public's most valuable and precious luggage is on the bus. And that ownership is being claimed by other stakeholders as their property because the patient's voice and rights are not present. Discussions amongst the research community like those today are really important to flesh out the issues as it pertains to the community for genomics research. However, I would just like to highlight that although there will be wide and various options within the research community itself, there will be an overall level of similar thinking, culture, educational background, and scientific thought process. There's also understandably ego, careers, politics, papers to be written, great research and commercial deals to be done. All very normal within any sector. It is similar to other sectors like my own sector, which is the subsector of the financial sector. I would stress though, that when we're dealing with stakeholders, particularly patient and publics outside our own professional sectors, they may not talk the same language or have the same set of beliefs, or they may have different wants and needs. For example, to a banker, a mortgage is a financial product with a lot of the financial modeling that goes along with that. But to the customer, a mortgage is something very, very different. It means a home, a safe place of sanctuary where they can rear their families, create memories, as well as it being an asset in a very individual Irish psyche. 
That same one product of a mortgage has very different meanings, values, and purposes to different stakeholders. I would think this is very similar to how a patient or a public consider the ger genomic data versus how a scientist might. For the scientist, it is a data stream, a necessary raw commodity for the research they want to undertake. It is impersonal, it should be. For the patient, the public, the citizen, it is their identity, their very being, who and what they are, their clan, their history, their family, their risk profile. It is deeply personal, and understandably, there is an emotional link to this class of data. There is also the fears of this risk of the data being exploited, ending up out of their control and in the wrong hands. These values, emotions, beliefs, and fears cannot be ignored and must be respected. Not acknowledging and engaging with citizen stakeholders on the issues that are important to and impertinent to them in a common language will erode trust risk and the involvement of a collaborative stakeholder in the research going forward. So I'll finish up with what can be done. In order for any collaborative stakeholder project to work, all stakeholders need to be involved. Otherwise, a stakeholder, otherwise the project is built on a foundation of sand. I would suggest, for what it's worth, a forum along the lines of a citizen's assembly. The patient, the public, the citizen is a key stakeholder. And as I've mentioned before, there are huge imbalances of powers and knowledge between the stakeholders. They will need the input of expertise and support of independent players, such as cross-party political representatives, legal experts, ethical, and importantly, data protection experts. If I can just take your minute for, for take an extra minute here. Data protection is the elephant in the room here. With researchers, I have often sensed that it is seen as an embargo to doing good research. This grinds my gears, but I'll try and be more diplomatic. Data protection is not just a question of records management or secure mortgage or secure storage. It is an expression of the dignity of human beings, their rights, their freedoms, and the rights to be the authors of the stories of their own lives. It is this human being's right-based approach which is, the, which is embedded in an ethics-based research model. A model which treats patients' data as something to be mined or an asset to be exploited will inevitably fall into error from losing the sight from one key element of patient data. It is about the person. Medical researchers and clinicians alike are stewards of their data. The patient may happily agree to contributing their data to research when given the opportunity to do so. But valid consent requires a whole of experience approach to informing patients. Designing systems in line with the duties that consent places on that system throughout the whole use of that data. And always keeping the significance of this data to a human being and to their family to the forefront of the design process. I'm not sure that's integrated into our system. Genomics research and, 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 and medicine is crucial to the future of Irish healthcare. Therefore, it has to be a national citizens conversation in my view. Irish people have been phenomenally supportive of research and I have no doubt they will continue to be altruistic and supportive of genomic research when they understand the potential uh, benefits that can accrue. Whether that is a public or a private is for all stakeholders to decide. I'm so happy that John mentioned the Finnish project today, and he's far more knowledgeable in this than I am. But from an amateur, I looked at that and I could align with that as a patient. We've only limited time here, but I will leave you with one little story and a plea. Over 35 years ago, a young woman dying with breast cancer said to her 14 year old daughter, I cannot say you will never be diagnosed with cancer. In fact, I believe there's an inheritance factor to our family history of breast cancer. But know this, science will find a way that it will not be the same for you as it is for me. Promise me you will trust science, believe in science and support science. How prophetic those words proved to be. The 42 year old woman was my mother. I was the 14 year old. I have been diagnosed with breast cancer. I have inherited the BRCA1 gene. And as she predicted, my outcome this far has been very much different to my mom. 
However, knowing about BRCA is one thing. It is just a preventative measure for a very tough preventative uh, decisions that have to be taken. I've had triple negative breast cancer. There's still no effective targeted therapy for this breast cancer subtype. So if it recurs, if it progresses, I'm fairly goosed in a short period of time. There is a long way to go in research. So here's my final plea. Don't let down my mum. Don't let down patients. I have tried to live up to the promise. Patients have skin in the game. Let's all seize this great opportunity. Let's include all stakeholders' voices and inputs, values and interests to find the best way forward for genomic research in Ireland. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. Many thanks, Eileen. Um, and very important uh, first panelist speaker as the patient representative. And I think you and your mother captured what this is all about um, very well. And, and we really, I really appreciate you telling that story. Um, and we do have to trust science. And, and I suppose that's what today is about. But we also have to trust people and patients and involve them in, in what we're doing and that your message is really strong. So thank you so much for that. Um, and now I'm going to move to, to the scientist, to Professor Walter Kolch, who's the Director of Systems Biology Ireland and involved, I think, leading Precision Oncology Ireland. And I'm going to let Walter introduce himself and why is he why he's here today and, and set his stall out. So thank you. Yeah, hello. It's a great pleasure of <clears throat> having me. Uh, I think discussions like this are really, really important and they're really necessary to move the field forward. And we will hear very different perspectives, but I think at the end, we need to come to the table, you know, and make something constructive out of it. And uh, John has already mentioned some great options. And um, I think this talk was really inspiring and also showing, you know, how we can actually make something out of, of this. But it is a great opportunity in which we really don't want to miss. And actually for myself, um, for, it's for me, it's actually really also a personal story because I started out as a clinician and I really enjoyed medicine because I enjoyed working with patients, but I got frustrated because it was always one-on-one, -on -one, very slow. And I wanted to have just, you know, do something with his bigger impact. So. I became a researcher and I did research most of my life. Uh, and I spent most of my time in very basic research. So studying how cancer cells arise, what makes them drug resistant. Uh, so actually very far and remote from the patient. But now with these new technologies, which we have, including genome sequencing, that actually, you know, is a way back. It brings me again back closer to the patient because now we actually can look at <clears throat> individual phenotypes, we can look at individual patients, we have sort of a blueprint, and we can analyze a patient uh, in a much more holistic way. And genome sequencing is only one of the technologies. There's many other ones which will be coming in the clinic soon, like genomic, uh, so like proteomics, metabolomics. But for, for me, this is really a way how we can get back to the patient. And of course, it is difficult. There's a lot of obstacles on the way. There's a lot of unresolved legal issues, but it is a huge opportunity where we can make medicine personalized and where we can make any uh, participants benefit from it. And the, what we are doing in, this is what we're trying to do in Precision Oncology Ireland, which is uh, co-led by Liam Gallagher. And it's a consortium of five Irish universities, uh, UCD, Trinity, RCSI, Cork and Galway, uh, six, cancer charities, and we are very grateful for their participation, and uh, eight industry partners. And what we're trying to do is exactly that. We're trying to understand how cancers arise on a molecular level. We try to understand what makes them drug resistant. Uh, we try to design better treatments, and we try to get back to the patient. And what we also try as a sort of a social experiment is how can we all work together between charities, patients, industry, and academia. <clears throat> And it is an experiment because this is the first time that this happens. Uh, but so far it has been a good experiment and it, a good experience. And I think it is the right way how we can move forward. What we desperately need is uh, policy. We need policy around you know, how to structure research and we need investment. Both investment into 
uh, the infrastructure, but also investment, how we can deliver these services, because there's actually a big difference in terms of genomics applied to the clinic or to healthcare and genomics as a research topic. I think there's still a lot of open questions in genomics. So if you compare it to an alphabet, we have learned the letters, we understand a few hundred words, but we don't really understand very well how the grammar works. You know, when we put words together in different ways, uh, the meaning can change. And this is the same with genes, you know, different constellation of genes may have different outcomes. And we still understand very little of this. We're still scratching on the surface. So there's a lot more research needed to understand it and actually leverage the power we have in the genome. And also, as John mentioned, there's huge difference between populations. So we need to get to grips with that. So I think the way forward is really having a close interaction between the stakeholders, but also have a very close interaction between the research and the healthcare implementation. So they need to go hand in hand. So that's all what I wanted to say. Wow, thank you, Walter. That was great. And under five minutes, so well done. Uh, not easy to do. Um, and I, I suppose picking up on what you're saying around policy, that we need policy. And Eileen was talking about the need for stakeholder involvement as well and, and citizens' engagement in that and using the assembly as a forum. So, you know, we're picking up ideas as, as you're speaking. So don't forget to put your questions into the Q&A panel just as the speakers are introducing themselves and um, because there's some really good ideas coming through. So next up is Dr. David Kavanagh, who's the Director of Clinical Partnerships in Genuity Science. So David, I'm gonna hand the floor to you to introduce yourself and why you're here today, set your stall. Are you muted, David? Thank you. I was so you can hear me now? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, well, good morning to everyone and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I, I think uh, both literally and metaphorically, I, I'm probably the, the Kerry man in Eileen's uh, earlier anecdote. Uh, I'm speaking to you this morning from just outside Killarney, so um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of Genuity Science, and um, I, you know, I'd like to thank especially Avril and the team for, for inviting our participation um, in this very important dialogue. Um, it's, it's very encouraging to us to see that so many people are, are engaged in the topic uh, and that you know, so many of us share a common interest in, in seeing the development of genomic-based medicine in Ireland uh, and the sector and the growth of the sector. It's very important to all of us. Uh, and it seems to me that, you know, even from, from John's talk this morning, from Walter and, and Eileen's contribution, there is a great degree and a great level of energy here that, you know, if, I think if it can be captured, can it, you know, will will create an impetus that will spur further development to the sector. And I think that's, you know, that's much needed uh, and, you know, would be a great impetus into, into the development of policy and infrastructure. For those of you, um, I think most of us, most People on the on the webinar probably are familiar with us, but for, for the benefit of those who maybe aren't familiar with Genuity Science, we're a global genomics data insights company. Um, we're focused on the discovery of novel therapeutics for complex or, or common diseases, as as John referred to them in his talk, um, using population genomics as a tool to to do that. Um, we work with with pharmaceutical and biotech companies, um, and, and by working with these companies, we believe that these insights can accelerate drug discovery and deliver benefit to benefits to patients. Uh, and already some of our work uh, is leading to novel biological insights that, that, that offer that promise or offer that potential to target diseases in new ways. Globally, we work with uh, you know, teaching hospitals and, and universities around the world and, and biobanks to carry out our research. Um, we've been bought, we, you know, we built a network of very important relationships around the world whereby you know we provide funding for research uh, you know via banking uh, and educational programs in universities and uh, through those programs we return to those institutions copies of the data set, data that is collected and, and generated in the course of the collaboration um, what i would say is that the return of data sets to partnering institutions for independent research is a core pillar of our collaboration model and we hope that 
it can you know not not just through our own analysis efforts but through the efforts of of our of our you know collaborators can can lead to many years of discovery and excellent science uh you know will be made possible through this kind of data sharing um principle um i mean i i'd like to maybe switch gears and draw attention as you know some recent very important recent work published by sally ann lynch and emer going that shows a tremendous burden of, of rare disease in ireland um, between the years 2006 and 2016 there have been 2368 deaths um that are attributed to an un, attributed to an un, underlying rare disease in children under the age of 15. Um, we're very proud that against this backdrop we we've been able to support the rare disease program at temple street um, where we provide uh, our sequencing and analysis expertise on a pro bono basis to support the diagnosis of children with rare genetic disorders. That program, since its commencement, uh, has, has seen us review and assist in the review, assist in the review of over 192 cases, and have been 30, 36 positive findings, which have, um, you know, have been very meaningful and important to the families, uh, children, and families involved uh, in those cases, um, and and that's something that that's been a tremendous source of pride for for all of our team uh, and and the clinicians i think that are involved in that project um, and we'd love to see that you know we'd love to see these services scaled nationally in ireland i think you know it's, it's very important that that you know i think that that could be achieved and delivered upon we're also very proud and and, and you know what Gab walters mentioned precision on college college ireland we're very proud to be an academic or an industry partner rather in that particular consortium i think it's a, an excellent not only you know research opportunity, but as, as Walter pointed out, uh, you know sociological study in some respects uh, to to see how we can work together, charities, patients, industry, uh, and academic groups, and you know, we've learned a tremendous amount already by interacting with you know with that consortia. Uh, similarly, we're very very excited to be involved in the CSFI Centre for Genomic Data Science, uh, and. Beyond this, we, you know, we've committed, and, and in addition to this, rather, I should say, we've committed over five million in funding to support various research and educational programs across Irish universities. Um, you know, for the period that we've been working in, in Ireland, and we look, you know, we look forward to building upon this in the coming years. So, before I finish, I just maybe want to reflect on a couple of learnings over the past several years. I mean, I've been with the company four to five years now, um, and we believe. You know that to ensure the successful development of a vi vibrant genomic ecosystem there are several areas where ireland simply must do better um the lack of evidence-based policy that sets out the nation nation the nation's vision and aspiration for the sector is sorely absent um, we have observed in other jurisdictions a good policy for formation can enable the, the development of clear guidance and codes of practice around the respective roles of private and public organizations in genomic research and on focused topics such as informed consent, data ownership, and responsible management to secondary findings. Currently in Ireland, this policy void is contributing to significant divergence of opinion, local variation, and hence confusion at many levels. There's a lack of sustainable investment in adequate genomic research infrastructure that serves the national interest. And I would like to, well, I would like to acknowledge the important role that many people present here on this particular webinar have played over many years in advancing infrastructural investment. Ireland remains behind the curve when it comes to um, the type of infrastructure that's required to be successful in this arena. The key ingredients, in our opinion, to be successful in population genomics are high quality biosamples collected and stored in a consistent manner and the curation of phenotype over long periods of time that can exquisitely detail the features of a disease. Internationally, countries that, that John has referenced, Finland, the UK, Estonia, have all invested significantly over many years to develop biobanking infrastructure, skills infrastructure that enable high quality cohorts to be uh, assembled in a responsible way that, you know, the skills and expertise that are, that are and corporate governance that are required to, to, to store those materials. The development of standardized consent models, appropriate access and governance frameworks, trained staff, physical infrastructure, such as electronic health records, scalable bio and data banks, and infrastructure for safe uh, and effective data distribution and analysis are all required if Ireland is to play um, a, a role at a global level. Ireland must commit in a meaningful way to developing such core infrastructure to ensure the sustainability and true advancement of genomics in Ireland. Finally, then, before I finish, we do believe that it's essential that there's much more open and transparent public discourse around the true risks and benefits that exist in genomics research. 
There are many evolving and complex societal and ethical issues, and they should and must be discussed. These topics are not unique to Ireland. They continue to evolve internationally and will continue, continue to do so for many years to come. Ireland has always punched well above its weight on the global stage in many different areas. There is no reason why Ireland, with the right public investment and commitment, cannot become a world leader in genomic research. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, David. And um, I didn't know you were down in Kerry. I'm, I'm sorry for your trouble at the weekend. I'm sure there's a few Cork people on the line. Um, we're, licking their hands. we're licking our wounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, I can't really speak from where I'm from. Um, at the moment, but but just thanks for that. And I, I, I hear that policy piece coming through again. Um, I see comments coming in as you're speaking about, we need the Department of Health here, we need the HSE here. So there's a clear message coming through from every single speaker around guidance um, uh, and around investment, around infrastructure, um, whether you're commercial, whether you're a patient or, or whether you're a scientist. So that it's always good to find where we're all speaking off the same hymn sheet first. Um, and again, just remind everyone, use the Q&A. I see there's three questions there in the Q&A. Just keep going on that because we want to use those questions for the discussion. Um, but thank you very much, uh, David. And we'll come back to you in the discussion piece. Um, next up is Dr. James O'Byrne, who's a consultant in biochemical ge clinical genetics in the Matter Hospital. Um, you're very welcome, James. And I'm going to hand the floor over to you to introduce yourself, give us a bit of background. Um, and just let us know your thoughts on, on what you've heard today. You're kind of lucky because you get to you get to reflect on, on what others have said as well. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is James O'Byrne. I'm a, a clinical geneticist with a special interest in biochemical diseases working in the Matter Hospital. And um, first of all, I have to say that you know this type this type of forum is so important, and um, it's great to see um, see it happening. And hopefully, there'll be far more of these. Um, um, future. My perspective really comes as a clinician working at the cold phase, um, trying to establish um, genetic diagnoses in patients and in their families, um, and using genomics and the technologies around genomics to do that, and then using those technologies to manage and treat the patients going forward. Now, clinical genomics, where I live, and research genomics are inextricably linked. The technologies that we have to do what we do have only occurred because of the advances in research genomics. So research genomics has to continue and be facilitated to continue. Without that, we won't continue to improve patient care. I'll give you an example of the NHS uh, National Genomic Service, which has now come to be very recently. It has been built on the bedrock of research genomics, the 100,000 Genome Project. So this shows exactly how research genomics can be used and brought into the clinical domain to affect change in a positive way for patients. Where are we at? Okay, so we know we're behind the curve. We've got some stuff done, but plenty more to do. It's great to hear that the program for government have factored in the National Genetic and Genomic Network, and as that has been established and the leads are being appointed, there is other things that we can do to help along. First is around policy. I know Walter just mentioned there recently. We have the expertise already to start developing these policies, policies around data handling, around secondary and additional findings. Why not? Let's, let's start doing it, first of all. Secondly, um, I'd like to mention around the digital side of things. And I know Arvid at the start mentioned about the electronic health record. And then John mentioned about telehealth. Again, these things can be looked at now, and they should be brought in. We have the opportunity to learn from mistakes made in other countries. They should be brought in so that clinical genomics and research genomics can be factored into it. So that it is GDPR compliant, that the patient is kept at the center of it, but it also facilitates research um, and possible future industry partners um, uh, utilizing this massive resource. The third I would like to mention is about the public awareness um, and knowledge program that 
we absolutely should start rolling out now to build the trust um, that Eileen so um, so nicely laid out. So these are these are things that can that can happen now before we have our national genetic and genomic um, uh, network in place. One, one more other point I'd like to mention is around training. I'm one of eight clinical geneticists in the country. Uh, we need far, far more. It's great to hear that we have 115 data scientists in genomics coming through, um, but we need many more clinicians trained up to be able to handle the data as well. Those clinicians have to be clinical geneticists and genetic counselors, but also the subspecialists that can handle the genomics of their area. Health Education England invested heavily seven years ago in a genomics education program, and now they're be just bearing fruit now. So this also has to be something to factor in. And I I'll mention the National Biobank that people have talked about. Again, this biobank, as it, it can be talked about, it can, we can start setting this up. Again, it should be set up in a way that factors in the possibility for um, research into the, in, in, in the future. To finish, I, I'm going to mention, like, because I like to finish on a positive note here. Sure, we we are. It's a little bit like the Wild West at the moment. Okay, there's no sheriff in town. There's nobody really sort of you know holding things together. But there are pockets of brilliance going on around research genomics in the country, and and being brought out into the clinical domain. I just want to mention a couple. One is around the Target 5000 project, run out of fighting blindness. I know Lord Brady is on the line here. It's an excellent example of a research projects looking at retinal dystrophies, understanding the genetic basis of the retinal dystrophies, and then now it's been applied out into the clinical domain. And the leads of this project, David Keegan, Jane Farrar, Paul Kenna, Julie Silvestri, imply the clinical genetics team in order to do that. So we've got a clinical geneticist and a genetic counselor working to bring it out in a safe, effective, and efficient way into the, into, the, into the clinical domain. The second is I'd like to mention is Future Neuro. I think we're one hospital I'm an RCSI, do some excellent work. And also I'd like to also just mention the program David Cavanaugh alluded to there. The Undiagnosed Rare Disease Program through CHI Temple Street, working with Genuity Science to make these very difficult diagnoses in children and oftentimes novel diagnoses in children. So we all need to work together, for sure. We all need to support each other. If we can all pull together and these pockets of brilliance work, you know, I, have, I am in no doubt that we have a premier division of genomic service, which the Irish person deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, James. And I think you speak um, for many in terms of, of some of the points you made around Ireland and and you know when we when we work together uh, we can do a lot uh, I mean I hope I work in Cancer Trials Ireland and we've seen that in oncology uh, the community have worked together in some of these areas and and it has worked in pockets um, and and I hat tip to fighting blindness I think um, what they've done over 30 years in this space has been phenomenal and, and a kind of guiding light for for the rest in, in rare diseases. Um, so in terms of the Q&A, um, we've got some questions coming in. Some are, some are targeted at, at some people in particular. One, James, I might just start with you because um, Giampiero Cavallari asked, can, you, can someone comment on the National Genomics Medical Network? And I have a feeling you just alluded to that, um, it, that this was mentioned in the program for government. Well, I can, I mean, the wheels are in motion from what I understand. Um, they are, I, I believe the HSC and Department of Health are actively looking for the leads for this project. Um, and of course, the leads when appointed will draw up the infrastructure for the National Genetic and Genomic um, Network. So it is, I, I think COVID has thrown a spanner in the works to a certain degree, but I know that, that um, there is a, an active process now um, and it has been um, earmarked, but beyond that, I, I, I can't really comment. Okay. Does anyone else have a comment on that before we move to the next question? Um, David, I'm going to, um, the, the next one is from, from the same um, member. 
around the Temple Street project, and it's great to hear, but to put in context less than 2 million relevant funding, um, and Future Neuro has sequenced return, returned results to a similar number of patients working closely with clinicians involved all across the country. How can Genuity provide more, more back to the public system that in reality is a key enabler of their work? So not an easy question, David, but I, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's a single answer, uh, Evelyn. I, I think I, I would say, you know, in a number of ways, we we are already are giving back. I mean, you know, I think, first of all, I suppose our focus is on complex disease, right? So much of our research, people have chronic illness that will unfortunately um, be with them for in most of their adult lives. Um, so we are hopeful that, that you know, our, the work that we do with our pharma partners can lead actually to drugs that will have a meaningful impact on people's health and well-being into the future. Um, and I know, you know, I know there's a criticism that that's that's too far and too too far out and too vague. Um, but but you know, from our perspective, it is meaningful. Uh, it is a meaningful you know thing for us to try and, and make a contribution back to the Irish public. Beyond that, I mean, I think the other the other areas where you know we provide put a lot of emphasis, you know, as I said, we are giving data that we generate back into the into the into the system, into the public system. Now, at the moment, due to the, the lack of infrastructure in the country, that has to be done on an institution by institution basis. We we there is no national program that we, for example, can can generate data and provide it uh, into the system through. So it has to be done on a system or on an institute by institute basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we hope the use of that data can also, by by sci independent scientists, can lead to to further breakthroughs. Uh, there was a question as well. Just it's not exactly on that, but just I'll, I'll ask you while you're here is, um, to could you provide informed consent forms and patient leaflets for all patients on your website? Now I don't know if you understand. Is that not available on the website at the moment, or should it be? Um, are you? So, so we, yeah, we, I mean, we have, we have, we have discussed that and, and publishing it on the website. I think some of the challenge, so the, the reason we haven't done it is, is mainly due to operational pro, uh, challenges, right? So if anyone's familiar with clinical research, when you put in a, a patient information leaflet to an ethics committee, it tends to accrue changes and requests for changes locally from that committee. So your, your, your patient information leaflet tends to accrue variation so there tends to be lots of different sl slightly different versions of pills in circulation now they all typically contain the core pieces but it does create a versioning problem so the reason we haven't published it to date is is is, is just down to pure version management of the patient information leaflet. but you've no problem sharing it if people are asking no. for it yeah okay okay um just could, in terms could i just could yeah, i just say something ahead, about the the, it was mentioned several times now, sort of the vague hope of uh, genomics accelerating drug discovery. I, I actually used to work for a pharmaceutical company, which was laid down bought by Pfizer, and I was doing drug discovery, trying to develop new cancer drugs. It's a very hard business, and it has been very inefficient over the last, you know, 20 years. We have not made much progress. But actually genomics already has changed that a lot because the targeted therapies, they come out of genome sequencing. They come out of that we can now map gene mutations and make drugs against these mutations. And for instance, uh, the medications which we have now against melanoma, there are and we make inhibitors, they came out of these efforts. They came out of genome sequencing and melanoma used to be basically a deadly disease. Now it's a manageable disease to a large degree thanks to these new drugs and thanks to immunotherapy. So I think the only thing I want to say, it's not the vague hope. I think there's very concrete examples that it works. Yeah, thanks, Walter. And, and I think we, we have a few patients on the line that I could, will agree with you there, but some of them will say when, when the country decides to pay for those drugs, they work. And um, that's, an, that's, another, that's another conversation. That, that's an, another, that's another issue. I mean, that's a political issue, and it, I think it, that's a totally. healthcare issue, but also uh, at the moment, Drug development is hugely expensive, and I think we need to learn how to streamline this. I mean, we can't keep developing drugs which then cost 100,000 euros per cycle. So, you in know, terms but of. It's a different imagine, question. While you're there, Walter, you know, in terms of precision oncology, you've got a lot of key people in the room. You know, you've got, you're working with commercial entities, you're working with researchers from academia, 
You've got charities who are very significant charities. I believe the Irish Cancer Society are part of it as well, supporting your efforts. But the key, would you say you have clinicians, clinical teams, the HSE, the Department of Health? You know, are we missing that that policy piece? That we are completely missing engagement by the policymakers. Unfortunately, we have tried to engage with them, and I think so with many other people in this room. We have very good, on the other hand, very good engagement with clinicians. So actually, this is one thing that really works in this precision oncology island consortium. We have basic research, translational research and engagement with clinics. And for instance, the two projects I have, uh, <clears throat> I have both clinical partners and were clinical endpoints and we do basic research as well. And I think this is actually the way it should be. You know, this is bringing out the best of research, but this is also a way how we can involve patients very early on, because I think we need to involve patients more in the design of research as well. And at yeah. the moment, there's no mechanisms for this, but the clinic and the charities actually do offer us mechanisms how we can engage with patients at a much earlier point in time. And I think this is very critical. Just bring them in. We just bring them into our disease groups. We've got patient advocates that know as much as some of the clinical people in the room. Um, and they're discussing trials, and they can, they can, they they can do it. So, um, but that does take time to 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 do. Uh, I'm just conscious that Eileen, um, I there's a question here from Louise Gallagher, Eileen, and and you are the representative of the patient, um, population, but also the public in terms of what you were talking about. And and one of the things Louise is saying is that we we have to really, I think, what you're trying to say is you have to really educate the public and people about why genomics is important. And we'll have to be prepared to support patients and families to navigate and understand data and implications. Do you have any comments on that, Eileen, or, or have I got you? I can't see you. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I think the fully informed and inf uh, uh, information aspect to patients is hugely important. And that's where the, the stakeholder engagement becomes involved. Um, you know, in in relation to how it all works, though, I think it needs to be a lot more streamlined. It needs to be a lot more, a lot less fragmented, um, and it needs to be policy driven. And you know, if there are any media here today, I, I I would say that I am actually personally disappointed that neither the Department of Health or the HSC could actually be here today, because that's it, it is really important that they actually are, because that is what's actually going to drive. We need a focus, we need a strategy, we need engagement, and we need involvement of everybody. And that has to be all pulled together. We have researchers trying to do the best that they can and pull it together. We have patient groups trying to do what they can. We have patients, individual patients, trying to say, we all need this. Uh, we have ph pharmaceutical and, and, and industry partners saying, we want to be involved. But that all has to be pulled together. And when it crosses a public health system, there has to be public health involvement, there has to be state involvement, and all stakeholders have to be involved. So all the bits are there, but nothing is getting pulled together here. And there's no focus and there's no strategy. Um, and it's just, as I say, I think it's really disappointing here that they haven't come along today. I know there's a lot of things going on, but I hope our media uh, contributors here will reflect that point. Well said, Eileen, and I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think it's a leadership piece, isn't it? Mm. And, and finding, you know, key ambassadors for that. And I know we did it with rare diseases. You know, we campaigned hard, thanks to Europe, actually, to develop a national plan for rare diseases. And, and we kind of forced those conversations in Ireland. Um, and we got somewhere with that. So maybe that's what we need here. And um, I'm just really curious, because we've heard it from all the panel in, in various different questions there. But John, you've observed this whole, and really appreciate you staying on the line for this entire um, uh, day more, and I know it's very early in New York, so we really appreciate it. Do you have any thoughts on, on what you've heard? Are you surprised by anything you've heard? Or, or have you ideas on what we could do next as a group to work together to drive genomics here? Not really surprised. Um, I, I serve on the Uthros of NUI Galway, so I've been coming home for visits uh, five times a year for that. And when I come home, I try to meet up with colleagues who are in genetics, genomics, and so I've got, I've, I'm not completely dissociated from the discussions that have been having ha happening in Ireland. Um, I'm I'm surprised that it's 
the recognition has been there. I've been serving on the Uzero since 2013. Um, these discussions have been happening since 2013, to my knowledge. Um, I don't understand why things don't progress. And my feeling is that there are a lot of very well-intentioned people and very well-informed people, you know, true international caliber experts in Ireland. And there's just no, there's no channel uh, that is going to, that looks like it's going to result in something productive. And I think that, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not in a position to be critical. I don't have uh, enough insights to be critical, but I really think that it would be valuable for uh, the politicians and civil servants to engage more robustly in this question, which is clearly engaging a large breadth of stakeholders within the population that they're meant to be um, serving. So if there was a little bit more on the part of policymaker in interest in moving this forward, and the, I loved Eileen's idea of a citizens assembly, um, where you could actually have a, an organized forum for how to bring this together. And uh, Susie Geiger in the chat window has put up a link to it. I was just uh, browsing it there. Some sort of mechanism for discussion and then some sort of clear outcome of the discussion. So it's not just people yapping at each other about how mm -hmm. they don't like the you know, clinical genetic services in Ireland, which you know, my mother is involved in and uh, it's clearly inadequate. So I'll have a word with her after this. Um, but uh, if, if, if there's some sort of clear outcome that says, if you do talk, it will be listened to, that I think would be a really important way of breaking the logjam, at least from my external perspective. Great. It's always good to get that. Um, and there's a fantastic question here, I think, for the panelists, and um, for the other panelists, just uh, from Advocacy Rare Disease Ireland, saying referring, and I'm going to, I think we have to finish on this because of time, um, or I'm going to get my wrist slapped. Um, so referring back to the journey, I wouldn't start from here. How do we get to the point where it is a good place to start? The lack of trust, misinformation and mudslinging, which I have to say we haven't seen today, is, is not helping any of us. What would one ask be? What Could everyone like walk away from this meeting and just give us one ask? So we'll start with you, Walter. What would your one ask be from, from hearing everything well, the, you've heard today? The, the, num the number one would be clarity. And that means policy, regulating genomics, regulating the relationships and the roles of the different stakeholders. The second one would be actually bringing the stakeholders together at the same table, designing that policy or helping designing that policy. The third would be investment. And uh, I think everybody agrees that uh, we are lagging behind there. And the fourth would be actually debunking some of the myths about genomics, you know, which would include forums like this, educational campaigns, <clears throat> So these okay. would be my four points. It's actually, it should be one, but number one is, is clarity. <laughs> <laughs> You're difficult. <laughs> so the next one, David, what would be your one or four <laughs> points? Thanks, Walter. I, what I mean, I, I, I think I probably just have one and you know, today is a good example of it. You know, we have to listen to each other and be respectful of each other's opinions. That's, you know, we come from different perspectives, but we share a common goal. So, um, you know, if we can, if we can do more to hear each other um, and speak to each other as human beings, I think we'll make more progress. Okay, trust is the is the key thing here, isn't it? Um, and then James, you're one. Yeah, so I think what is is, I mean, I'm coming in from the clinical side here, of course, but I do think that the the research genomics, like as Walter said, has to be brought through alongside clinical genomics. Um, and I would really like to see the establishment of the National Genetic and Genomic Network and the leads appointed to that, or at least transparency around where everything is at with this, because as John said, it's been dragging on now for almost a decade, um, and we just don't really know where, where we're at with this. Um, we have the talent here in the country or outside the country. Um, let's just make it happen. Eileen. Um, thank you, James. Thanks very much. That's a really good ask. Okay, um, my hope would be for all stakeholders to come together um, and for all inputs for all stakeholders to be taken on board. But what I would like is that the patient is at the very centre of, of, of that. And also recognising 
that the patient, and particularly within genomics, it's a family. It's a family decision. It's a mm-hmm. family reality. So that 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 is not an equal balance. So you're not talking about when you're talking about researchers and you're talking about patients and clinicians, there's a different power imbalance. So when a lot of us are giving our genomic data, we're on our way into the OR or we're, you know, we're in a, a vulnerable situation. So I think those power imbalances need to be addressed. And also, therefore, that the patients and other stakeholders that need to be involved are also the ones that will support the patients. So they're legal, they're ethics, they're data protection experts, and they need to be seen to be partners also as well as well in this. And overall, that needs to be pulled together with the policy, the public policy. Great. Thank you. I think we've heard from everyone. Um, on that, John, I don't know if you want to one takeaway of it. I think I've already got one from you, but well, I think if I'm going to get the last word, I'd, I'd like to thank you um, uh, and the other organizers and moderators of this uh, session, because this is precisely what is needed. It is bringing people together and people are talking in a respectful and productive way. And clearly there are frustrations that are bubbling up in the chat window and the Q&A and stuff like that. Uh, but this is exactly what should be happening. It's very productive, and uh, the more people get behind this, the more uh, we will have the potential for this to be get the momentum that will be required to turn it into something real. Thanks, John. And, and I'd love to take all the credit, but I'm not going to because uh, Avril Kennan and Linda and the team um, and um, Mary uh, in the background have put so much into this. And to, to get a panel like you all together, I think really represented all of the stakeholders today from the patient to commercial to the scientist to the clinician and, and I think it's been fantastic. We've a lot more to do. We've we've only just got started. We do have to have hard conversations as well and I know that um, and that's why Avril um, and the team are going to have another event like this in May 